right, that movie's coming out. I'm really excited about it. Um, so you're probably asking, okay, Jackie, why did you share that particular clip for this particular presentation? And so the reason why is because I want to make sure we set some disclaimers. I recognize that the fight for the liberation of black identified individuals is not new, right? That movie clip is regarding events that happened in the 60s. And so the fact that we're still having these conversations regarding black liberation for black identified folks in 2021 um, is, astounding. And so I want to recognize that. So what I'm talking about today is the same liberation fight that was happening in the 60s and the 50s, the 40s, the 30s. Once enslaved Africans were set on this land, this is the same fight of liberation. Also, I want to acknowledge that the fight for liberation for Black identified individuals is not just limited to the United States. I recognize that anti-Blackness is a global phenomenon. And though I'm focusing solely on United States, that's just because it's where my research has been located. This principles have can be applied worldwide and globally. So I wanna have that disclaimer too. I also wanted to take note that the fight for liberation of black identified individuals is not just limited to black identified individuals. The fight against anti-blackness is not just a black folks problem. It is a universal problem that can be tackled from different angles and from different people. I don't want this to be like, okay, this is only what black people should be doing or can be doing. Instead, I want this to be a discussion on how we as a whole can work towards the liberation of black identified people. And lastly, I wanna state that liberation takes on a lot of different form. There's not one way to have liberation. And in fact, my ideas about pedagogy of wokeness is just one piece of the liberation puzzle that is life. And so I wanna take that time to recognize that liberation takes on different forms so that you don't feel so boxed in like, okay, this is just one way for me to fight anti-Blackness. Instead, I want this to be like, oh, this is one of many ways to fight anti-Blackness. I also recognize that I may talk fast. So if you need me to slow down or to repeat something, feel free to jump on in and to say something, unmute yourself. I'm giving you that power and control um, because I want this to be an interactive space. Um, I have my timer to let me know how much time I have but feel free to, to jump on in, okay? It, or if you feel so more comfortable, you can put it in the chat and I'll make sure to read it at the end. So let me just introduce myself. Um, so like I said, my name is Dr. Jackie Darby. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist at AU. I'm also a certified group psychotherapist, meaning I have a specialty training expertise in all that is group and group therapy. I received my PsyD, which is my doctor of psychology, in 2017 from the American School of Professional Psychology. I'm also a contributing editor of a textbook called Black Millennials, Identity, Ambition, and Activism, which was released in 2020. But most importantly, which I why I might look familiar, is that I'm currently a staff clinician at the AU Pelsley Center. So um, where I conduct individual as well as group therapy, just as a same as plug, don't worry, I'm gonna be plugging the counseling center a little bit later on today. All right, so let's talk about some definitions. I always want to start off whatever presentation that I am doing with some definitions so that we're all on the same page of exactly what I'm talking about. So what is a millennial, right? We throw these terms around like uh, millennials, uh, Gen Zers, Generation X. So millennials are defined as individuals that are born between 1985 to 1999. And during that time frame, they've experienced major cultural shifts, such as a financial recession, the rising co um, college tuition costs, the invention of the internet in terms of what we see now, right? We recognize the internet was something that was kind of thought of and toyed with in the 60s, but the internet of what we see it now is something that's so readily available in homes, um, readily available to schools, readily like on our on our phones. That was something that was millennial generation really grew up in, right? We experienced a time, and I say we because I am a millennial, we experienced a time in which we didn't have the internet when we had to go outside and play, and the time in which we had the internet and we were hoping that an AOL free disc was in the mail so that we can have at least 100 hours of free internet. So we remember both times and that really has shaped 
how we view technology and how we view the internet. We also grew up in a time in which individuals regarding safety and security was threatened. We grew up with Columbine, we grew up with 9-11, we grew up with um, domestic terrorist attacks that happened in our own country. And as well as we grew up with going to wars and Operation Dead of Storm and stuff like that and other security, uh, what's going for? Security actions on a military front. So we grew up in all of that during that time period. And all of that is important to understand because that shapes how we view the world and it shapes how we kind of think about what liberation really can mean. So when I say millennials, this is the generation that I'm talking about. Now, racism, again, I wanna make sure we're all on the same term when it comes to what is racism. Racism is when a culture, individual, or institution uses physical features to justify the dehumanization of others. So that's when I'm saying racism, that's what I'm talking about. So it could be on a cultural level, it could be on an individual level, which if we think on an individual level, we're thinking of, you know, people saying inappropriate words, you know, hate crimes as such. Culture is just the idea of a culture having like anti-Blackness, for example, or anti-Asian. And institutions to think about the banking laws that are in place, redlining, um, anti-vote and voting restrictions that are in place, those are institutional instances of racism. So again, when I'm saying racism, this is the term that I'm using. Got some more definitions. Again, I, I put it all on the front because I want everybody to be on the same term before we get to the meat of what's going on. When I say liberation, I went basically to the basics. I went to the dictionary, uh, a movement seeking equal rights and status for a group. And specifically for a group that is not considered a part of the dominant culture. Notice I said dominant. I didn't say majority or minority, nor did I say a numbers game because um, you can be oppressed and technically have more numbers than the oppressor, right? Oppression does not have to do with anything with numbers. It's really about the dominance of that culture and where you're at, at that space. Oppression, if we're gonna talk about liberation, we're gonna talk about what oppression is. It's an unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power, something that oppresses, especially in being an unjust or excessive excuse of power. And this is done to a group that's considered to be, not to be of the dominant culture. And so it's important to notice the, the thing here is power and authority. And if I had more time, we would talk specifically about power and authority, but I only got an hour, so I'm making sure I hit what I can. Um, the reason is because this, again, like I said before, is not a numbers game. This is not something like, oh, we have more people in a space, therefore you are the oppressor. No, it's again about the excess use of authority and power. Do you have the power to take control of things? Do you have the authority given by an individual authority or institutional authority to do something. And that's where the idea of oppression comes from. It's the idea that these individuals, these institutions are using the, their power and authority that they either took or that was given to them, most likely took, to squish down uh, an, some individuals and their right and their authority. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about oppression. I think these are the last of my definitions. Let's see. Yes. So when I say wokeness, what does that mean, right? People throw about these words of woke, I'm woke, X, Y, and Z. Um, so what that is, it describes an individual who is socially and consciously aware of the systemic oppression that is happening. They are in a sense awakened from their sleep to the world that is not as free as the media often claims to be. After the election of um, President Obama, there's a lot of talk about being a post-racial society. And as we're realizing, it's like, actually, we're not as post-racial as we want to assume and want to believe. And so this idea of recognizing the systemic oppressions that are in place is this idea of wokeness or being woke. And with wokeness, there's also comes hotep. So what that means, people say, oh, this is a hotep thinking or this person's such a hotep if you've been on TikTok or Instagram or Twitter. So a hotep is really an individual who wishes to replace white male patriarchy with black male patriarchy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and the psychology behind that later on in this presentation. All right, so I'm gonna take a sip of water because I realized I was talking for a long period of time. Does anybody have any questions about any of those definitions?
I am interested in your definition around racism and mm -hmm. being more values-based rather than systemic. But that's a distinction that I'm sure you'll raise later in the discussion. That's a great, that is a, a great point, right? Um, values versus systemic in that, in that argument. The thing is, is that there is a values part to racism, but in terms of oppression and liberation, that's also more, I'm leaning more towards the systemic side of it because you can, you can have racism as a person and not affect me, right? If you're in a whole different state, you're not interacting with me day to day so that your racist ideas can stay right over in Timbuktu, wherever it's at. But if my system that I'm in is having racism, that impacts me greatly because I really can't go anywhere if the institution is racist, if the culture is racist, then I, that's where my oppression comes in. And that's where I need to come and liberate from. People are entitled to have racist thoughts. That's their, their right of choice. If you wanna be racist, hey, be you, do you. What you are not entitled to is have a system that's oppressing me because of the institution of racism. Does that make sense? Okay, I see, I see your, your videos. I, you nodded, so I'm, I'm good. Um, but that's a great point. I think that's something where we need to start having deeper conversations as we talk about liberation. So moving on, um, let's talk about pedagogy of the press, right? So for those who haven't read the book, I highly recommend getting this book. I don't get paid for any of this greatness um, that I'm talking about, but there's something that I feel like really helps move and shift the idea of what liberation can be like. So this book was written by Paulo Fier. Um, it was originally in Portuguese and was translated by Mira Ramos um, to English so that where those who do not speak Portuguese or do not read Portuguese could understand it. And it was really focused on getting the oppressor to see the humanity of those being oppressed. The idea or one of the ideas from this book is this notion that liberation is not just, does not just come from those that are oppressed, right? If you are oppressed, it is not your sole responsibility to undo the liberation, to undo the oppression, I'm sorry. It's also part of the responsibility of those who are oppressing to say, wait a minute, we need to figure out why are we doing this and how can we undo this? Because this is not correct. One way they say that to do this is for that those who are doing the oppressing, so the oppressor, has to recognize the humanity of the other. And what does that mean? In order to dehumanize, dehumanize someone, to take away their rights, to say, you know what, because of who I am and what I look like, I get to rule over you, you have to make the other individual seem less than human. And we see this every day, right? We see, we call people who are coming over from um, war torn countries, refugees, right? We say they're aliens if they're not from the United States. We call, you know, young black men thugs. We call them, you know, these, these prisoners. We, we call them other things rather than human because that makes it easier to separate the humanity that's in them. They're no longer a person if they're a thug, right? They're no longer a person if they're a criminal. Um, it's easy to say, well, those people are deserving of this because I don't see them as someone who's on my same level. They're not like me because I'm not like that, right? And so the idea is if we get the oppressor to see the humanity of the oppressed and say, you to say, hey, I am just like you, just like you are like me. We are equal in the humanity sense. Why are we treated equal? That's where liberation can come from. And so it's a dual front. Again, it's not just the work of Black people to liberate and fight against anti-Blackness. It's a global thing to do. And so how this was done through Paulo Fierro was through education. Let's decolonize the educational system, remind these individuals of their history and where they come from and who they are. And not just the individuals who are oppressed, but also those who are oppressing to say, look, this is the, these are the people who which you are oppressing. This is their culture, this is their history, this is their art. Once you have that, now you're starting to humanize other, the other person and therefore that's when liberation can come in. So the, he went through education. I say, you know what, this is a great idea, but I think millennials are doing this a different way. And so I came with this term of pedagogy of wokeness. And so I presented this in 2018 and to me this really, describe the act of liberation that was presented specifically for Black millennials. 
And this idea is that I, Black ones are using social media because we grew up with technology. We grew up with the internet. We saw it was kind of birthed and we saw how it could be used. We took this and we said, okay, we're going to show you the humanization. We're gonna show you the stories and humanize black people through this technology that is so widespread and so global that you cannot deny it. Now the next generation, Generation Z, just took that and said, okay, we're gonna top it. And they're just doing great work on their own. And later on in life, when I have more time and energy, I might explore how they're taking it and using it for their own liberation. But right now I'm just focusing on black women. And so they took this idea of social media and say, we're going to use this technology to show the human side of Blackness. And they use it to kind of make the narrative of Black identified individuals on a global scale and say, no longer are these stories and these instances that we're telling you or speaking our truth just hidden in our communities. We're going to show it in real time. So you cannot deny what you're seeing because it's here, it's in your face, it's on your phone, it's on your computer. You can't, you block it, you put it back up. It's constantly happening. So you cannot say this is just something of our imagination. Um, like I just said, so it's allowing for the humanity of black people to be seen across the world and challenge the narrative that is being set by white supremacy. So it's hard to fight a narrative if you are not in control of the story. I always joke at the Council Center when we have our little um, bake-off competition, it doesn't matter who wins or loses, who's, who's tell the story first. And if I get on Twitter and tell the story that I won, I don't care if you actually won because my story is already out there. So take that concept and, and apply it to white supremacy. They're going out and saying what the narrative is. This is what is going on in regards of what Black people are saying, because they control the media, they control the, the systems that are in place, right? They're saying, no, it's not what you're saying. The data is saying X, Y, and Z. And so what Black millennials are doing is saying, hey, we're taking the social media thing and we're gonna take it and we're gonna push out our narrative first because we understand how technology works and we have it accessible to us. And so regardless of what you're saying in newspapers and, and TV shows, you're already late because I've already shared it with 20 million people with just a click of my with a click of a button. So you're reporting one thing on CNN, but I've, it's 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 late. It's old. It's old news. We've already shared it, multiplied it, reacted to it, wrote blogs about it. And so how can you? What it's like? We already took the story first, and we're putting it in our way. So let's talk more about the social media influence. So like I said before, it's pushing for the narrative that regarding social injustices. In the past, the stories that were told about injustices were really passed down from generation to generation. We all have stories of, you know, grandpa so-and-so, uncle so-and-so, aunt so-and-so had this negative racial experience. And this is used to kind of teach and help educate the younger and the next generation of black individuals. Um, one instance of that shows is individuals who watch Watchmen. Spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen the TV show, but it's been out for a couple of years now. So I don't feel bad about the spoiler, but when the show featured the Tulsa riots that happened in Oklahoma, people were shocked about this. They're like, wait, this is part of US history? When did this happen? This is not something fictional and made up. Like this is a real thing that happened. And so, um, right, or Lovecraft Country, right? So these are things that are happening. These are, these are real instances. And people were shocked because they never heard the story. But if you were a Black American, you already knew the story because it was passed down from generation to generation, probably to another generation, because it was part of the history that was told to ensure that people, um, people are seeing this, right? And so a lot of people are, are chatting me like, hey, don't forget about Lovecraft Country. Exactly, another example of using media to showcase a story. And so the fact that this big part of our of American history was hidden because of this white supremacist uh, toll, not toll, uh, hands on the, the narrative, 
it's a point of saying this is why social media is important because now black people are taking their own narrative and pushing that forward. So no longer is these stories just only in, in a small pocket of town or in a family or X, Y, and Z. It also limits the ability to erase the fact that this event happened. So if I put it on social media and I share it with a whole bunch of people, even if you take it down, someone's has already screenshot it and shared it to someone else. And so oftentimes the white supremacist media that's trying to erase the narrative that's being shared is trying to play catch up to something that's constantly moving and constantly being shared. So you can't say this didn't happen. An example of the individual who had the woman threatened to call the cops when he was bird watching. Those instances happened to many people, but because it was filmed and because he had his phone out and was able to share it, she couldn't deny that it happened because it's right here. I have it on film. You can't say it didn't happen because it's right here. And not only is it right here, but I've shared it with other people. So even if you took my phone and deleted it, it's already out there. So now everybody else can see it. And it helps explore aspects of American history that has been swept under the rug. And I'm currently proving that point as we're talking. So the other side of, of social media is that it helps expose people and helps hold them accountable. The exposing people is not really that big of the the beauty of social media because we have instances where people knew about racist individuals and racist systems that were in place and they they weren't held accountable. But the piece of holding them accountable is where the black millennials are coming in. I say nothing moves faster than black Twitter. Facts. They will find the person who said the thing, who took, who did the action. They will find not only where they're at, they will find uh, their job and they will contact their job and say, just to let you know, this person who you are employed is doing these things. And because of this, I'm taking my money somewhere else. They will let the school know like, hey, you're about to give scholarship to this person. Let me let you know what's going on. So just in case you want to revoke. And we're seeing these things happen, right? So people are losing jobs. People are losing scholarships. There are sometimes legal charges. Now, do the legal charges stick? That's a whole different argument for a different day. But the fact that these people are getting charged is a step. I mean, hopefully that these the charges actually go past the charges and actually are people are holding legally responsible. Um, but the fact that they're being held somewhat accountable is something that I believe social media influence, the power of Black millennials, the voice of Black millennials is really leading that charge. It's also educating individuals and exposing culture. So it's educating people about the experiences of Black individuals, and it's also exposing the racial culture that is still in America. Again, we want to say and tout like, oh, we're post-racial, we're post-racial. But these stories and these images and these videos and these memes are showing like, no, we're not. These incidences are still happening in the year 2021. These are still things that my grandfather may have spoken about. I'm also experiencing. And so you can't say like, oh, this doesn't happen or they didn't apply to you when in, factual, in actuality, it did. And I have the proof and I have the evidence. So now more people are really kind of, for lack of a better word, awakening or getting woke and realizing, oh, wait, maybe the world isn't kind of what I thought it would, it is, or I thought, or I thought it was maybe we're still not over this race thing and we need to have deeper conversations about it. And so that awakening really helps push people towards a racial identity development. And so there are various racial identity developments for the different races that are out there. There's a biracial identity development. There is a black identity development, a white racial identity development, Asian race, Asian race um, ethnicity identity development. So they're out there. Um, but each one of them start with this idea that there's a moment in which the person realizes that their physical skin color has a social stigma attached to it and social privileges or a racial moment attached to it. And that moment where they realize that, that's when they enter a different phase of their racial development. 
And so we, because social media is showing these videos, these images, these stories, people are now getting exposed to that moment of saying, oh, wait, my, because I'm white, I have this power, this privilege, because I'm, I'm black, this, these experiences can happen to me before they may not have had it until they got to college, right? And then you've seen people when they get to college, they're like, I didn't know this could happen. But now they made me have these experiences earlier because social media is right there on their phone. So this also is impacting the racial development and maybe pushing people faster than they would actually have gone if they were able to go in their own pace. Taking a water break, okay. It's been fascinating as a staff person at a predominantly white institution, the conversation about creating a plural, a plural existence where you are not shielded from it, but that you know is a is a panacea for your diversity experience. And then you're like, <laughs> but it's still a predominantly white institution, and so the expectation sort of contradicts what the national trend for racism and, and prejudice that still exist. Mm. even in, in the sophisticated areas that we live in. Mm -hmm, exactly. So how do you help as, you know, I'm in a student field, right? I'm OCL. So how do we help students navigate that? And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get close to the end. Calvin's trying to jump me ahead of time. I'm like, you <laughs> through your water break, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So um, social, <laughs> social action behaviors um, are moving toward from traditional means of social engagement. And so black millennials are not really doing the whole door-to-door -door petition. And this is not because of COVID. Um, they're not doing the whole door-to-door -door petitions. They're using hashtags. They're using change.org. They're using other ways, email lists, email like, hey, you can click this one thing and automatically an email will populate to your senator. Rather than having that traditional, we're gonna go, we're gonna, you know, they're still doing marches, but we're gonna go door-to-door -door and have people sign and interact people. Black ones are not doing that. They're using technology to the benefit. And the reason is actually showing that black ones are less engaging in typical social action behaviors like voting, attending rallies, as such, go to door to door, but they're still as politically minded. And so the research is kind of questioning, well, why is that? If they're just as politically minded as other generations, what they're not as politically engaged, where is the disconnect? And what the research has found is that because Black millennials grew up in a time where there's a recession, security risk, high tuition costs, they're having families now, job insecurity, they're just doing so many different things, they don't actually have the time to do that, right? They're now, they have, in order to vote, they have to think about, okay, do I get up early to go to the voting lines to make sure I can vote before I go to work? Am I gonna have time off? And to you know, take an hour and a half or so to go vote. The line is going to be long. It's going to take forever. Do I have the mental capacity to stay there? Do I have the physical capacity to stay in those long lines to, to vote? Um, do I have access to an ID? X, Y, and Z. All those different things that are these systems that have been in place are now impacting the Black millennials' ability to engage in the way that they want to. But the desire to engage in political activities is still there. Even if the Research is saying they're not as engaged. And also they're tired <laughs> um, for this. Right, and so someone is chatting to me that Black women, they mentioned that Black women are targeted more at rallies and demonstrations. That is true. Also the consequences of, you know, getting arrested, um, getting tear gas are, are felt more because if they get arrested, they may have not have the money to get bailed out. They may have to go through the system. That system can negatively impact their job prospects. They have to have hospitalization because they got tear gas and says they may not have insurance and now how they gonna pay for that bill. And so now it's compounded because of the fact of where they, the generation that they live in and what's going on. Great point. Um, and also in terms of what for Black millennials was looking like in terms of liberation is that liberation now is really pushing for inclusivity. So now Black liberation is queer affirming. Now is fighting for gender equality. And now it's also addressing social economical inequalities. And this is not saying that this wasn't happening before, 
because uh, again, as I said in the, in the beginning, the disclaimer that black fight for black liberation is the same one that's been going on for generation upon generation. It's not so we're not saying that those other generations weren't as inclusive. We're saying now that black women are really putting that out in the front open. It's like, no, we're fighting for the liberation of all black people, not just heterosexual cisgender black males or heterosexual cisgender black females, but rather all black people, regardless of social economic inequalities. Okay, checking my time, making sure I'm good. And so with that inclusivity, that purposeful inclusivity, that push of using technology, the push of getting the narratives told and out there, there's also a push back, right? And whenever you try to change the system, the systems that are already in place that are benefiting from the oppression are really gonna start saying, no, 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 we don't want things to change. And so one thing that we're noticing is the drive to replace the oppressor. So one thing that Paulo Fierro mentions in his book is that the oppressed, in terms of true liberation, should not drive to become the new oppressor, right? We're not going to overthrow the systems just to become the new systems. But for some individuals who are like, yeah, I, I want liberation, I want equality and equity, but also I wanna be in charge, that's not liberation. That's just replacing one oppressor with another. There's also this idea of, again, I mentioned before, hope taps, right? This, this desire to replace white male patriarchy with black male patriarchy is this idea of like, wait a minute, if I address these oppressive symptom systems, that also means I have to address my own problematic behavior that's upholding these oppressive systems. I keep saying symptoms, I apologize. Systems. If I'm saying, hey, these systems are anti-women and they're anti-LGBTQ, now also I have to call myself out of when I have been anti-woman or anti-LGBTQ or anti-poor. Um, I have to call that out and that's uncomfortable. Wait a minute, I didn't ask for this. I just wanted to be able to walk down the street safely. I'm not trying to change my own behavior. And so because that um, disconnect, that uncomfortability of asking for change while not addressing um, a your own behavior is the idea of hoteps. Like, well, I'm gonna push back against change then. I'm gonna go against what is beneficial for me because I'd rather stay where I'm at with a little bit of power that I have versus giving up my power so that everybody else can have equality and equity. So it's expected because again, whenever there's change, there's always gonna be a, a, a system that's trying to keep, maintain the status quo. But hopefully, the idea is as more people push for liberation, that the voices of the hoteps are kind of silenced. Not silenced, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, yes, I am trying to say silence, but they're worked through their own insecurities are worked through. And that happens through therapy and X, Y, and Z. And there's also a rise of white supremacy. And we're seeing this now, right? This wave of new white supremacy that come in, these new systems that didn't come in place, the tax on the rallies, the, the pushback to challenge the, the votes, X, Y, what happened in January. We're seeing this rise because people are throwing what I have to call a tincture tantrum of saying, wait, I don't, I don't wanna give up my power just yet. I'm not ready just yet. So I'm gonna do what I can to hold on to it. Again, the more that people fight for black liberation or liberation in general, the louder that tincture tantrum is gonna be. It's to be expected. That's what happens when change happens. As those who are fighting against anti-blackness, what we have to do is maintain our cause because the moment we slip up and give into those, that, ten, that temper tantrum, that's reinforces that that behavior is okay. So we want to make sure that we keep on fighting towards liberation. So you're saying, okay, Jackie, you talked a bit about this idea of pedagogy of wokeness. You talked about um, how social media is really pushing the narrative of black millennials and how that is shaping how black millennials are engaging in liberation. You talked about the social actions that are coming in place as well as the pushback of black liberation. So how do I help people do this work? How do I support black millennials? I love a good acronym because acronyms are easy to remember. So think of a vase, right? 
So first V is to validate their experience. Their experience is their experience. Just because you didn't have it that way doesn't mean that what they saw, they felt, they experienced isn't valid. So making sure you validate that their experience. And it's not like, a oh, yeah, that totally happened. That's right. It's more of like, wow, I hear what you're saying. And I hear how that's negatively impacting you. I honor that. I recognize that. That's the type of validation I'm saying. We don't need to, pass, uh, to pacify someone. We don't need to say, oh, poor you, they're there. No, we want to say it's like, I hear what you're saying, and I honor that. So once you validate their experience and recognize that their experience is their experience, you want to acknowledge the emotions and the thoughts that come up. The shift between thinking race isn't a concept to, oh my gosh, race is a concept, and this is what my race means in America is a big shift for people. It's huge. And it can stir up a lot of emotions. It can stir up a lot of thoughts. It has people looking at others in a certain type of way. Like, wait a minute, if you're my friend, how can you say these things about people who look like me? What does this mean about our relationships? And we're working with, with individuals, especially with Black millennials who are shifting and going from out of college or maybe they're going back to school to going full-time in the workforce to maybe now taking care of their parents, like a lot of things are happening and changing. And so having this experience can be very scary for individuals. So you wanna acknowledge any feelings, emotions, thoughts that come up for that individual and say, hey, whatever you're feeling, I, I hear you. And it's okay to feel that way. You don't have to get stuck there. Um, you wanna provide space. Now I couldn't, I had to put the provide in, in brackets because it doesn't go with the acronym. Didn't want to mess that up, right? Don't have a wasp or VOSP. So to keep the S, space is the S. Um, you want to make sure the space is safe enough. Now, what does that mean being safe enough? It means that you recognize that when you're engaging with individuals, you might slip up, you might make mistakes, you might cause what we have, what we say is a, a rupture in that relationship. That's okay. What's more important is that you're able to repair that rupture. You're able to say, oh, I apologize. Let, let me, let's talk about it. How can we undo this? Because you want to make sure this thing, the relationship is safe enough, the space is safe enough that they can, you guys can have that discussion. What happens, a lot of people are afraid of that discussion because it's uncomfortable. Again, you're showing your vulnerability. You're saying, I messed up. And they try to avoid it by canceling each other, like, oh, I'm just going to cancel. You you said something inappropriate, I'm just going to cancel. Rather than say, wait, 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 you this thing that you said just hurt my feelings? Can we talk about it? Can we re have this repair? Because this obviously was a rupture. And so once you're able to provide the space, again, recognizing that it's safe enough, you want to educate. So you want to review the ways in, to decolonize your own learning. Educate does not mean that the Black person is here to teach you unless they want to, unless they are paid to, to do that. What this means is that you're taking the initiative to look at other ways that you can decolonize your own thinking. And this is for individuals regardless of race or culture. We all have to decolonize our way of thinking. So you can use YouTube, you can use podcasts, books, movies, whatever, Netflix, Try to explore some things just to, to get more exposure into your own experience of what other people possibly could be going through and not just rely on like, well, this is how I experienced it. Therefore, this must be the way rather than say, well, this is how I did it. But I know that my experience or the way that I've done it is shaped by a different culture. And so maybe through your eyes, you experience something completely different. So again, how do you support Black males? You want to validate you want to acknowledge, you want to provide space, and you want to educate. So again, I mentioned a shameless plug. Here's the plug. One way to help people do that is to go through counseling. And so the beautiful thing about AU is that we actually have therapy, teletherapy for our students, as well as we provide consultation for our staff and faculty. And so at the Counseling Center, we provide psychological care for student community. All services are free and confidential. Um, we do offer time-limited individual therapy, so six to eight sessions per academic year. But our group therapy is unlimited. 
So what I tell people is our groups are small. So six to eight people and two therapists, and you can do that for the whole semester, come back in the fall and continue with the same group. And so we offer three different types. We offer ones where understanding self and others, which is about how do I connect to people? How do I have these difficult conversations? How do I do a rupture and repair? How do I get support? And we also have groups that are specifically for identities. So we have our voices, which is a supportive space for students of color. I ran this group a couple of years ago. It was great. It's for students of color to talk about what it means to be a student of color on a PWI. What does it mean to have this idea of liberation? What does it mean to have that moment where you recognize that your skin color means something in the United States? And what does that mean for you? And we offer a new group this year called Black Folks Heal, which is specifically for individuals who identify as Black or the African diaspora. Um, again, having those conversations of what was 2020 and what did that mean for me as a Black individual and how can I relate to other Black individuals as we kind of navigate this idea of liberation. And we also have an LGBTQ plus group. Again, that same principle of like, okay, how does my sexual identity impact these other parts of myself and how can I relate to other people? And for some individuals, it's nice to have a space where you can have these thought processes out loud with other individuals who have an idea of what you're going through and experiencing and can help, help you support as well as help you challenge some of the, your thoughts as well as having two therapists in the room who are specifically trained to help you navigate the path that is um, going through liberation. And like I mentioned before, we also offer consultation and referral services. If you are a faculty member or staff member, you're like, hey, I wanna kind of figure out how I can support more students. What are ways that I'm doing it? Please call us. We, we love having these conversations. Um, it's great. Our hours, our Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We have urgent care hours, which is our drop-in hours, Monday through Friday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And um, our protocol services. So for students who are not physically located in Washington, D.C., Virginia, or Maryland, they can use our protocol services, which is not location-based. Um, that number is 202-885-7979. They will be connected to a licensed clinician. Our services are only available right now to individuals who are physically located in Maryland, D.C., or Virginia, just due to licensure laws. But if someone needs referrals getting to connect to a provider, they can always use our urgent care hours or they can schedule an IC appointment um, using our digital waiting room on our website. You guys will get copies of these slides, so you will have the link in your slide presentation that you can pass out to students. So right here, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Boom. So that we can have a good old discussion. I gave a lot of information and I'm right on time, which is what I like to hear. A lot of information thrown at you. And so I want to have a space where we can kind of talk and have a discussion about what you heard, what you thought, what came up, what stirred up for you. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Um, can I open the chat up? That's a great question. Let me figure it out first. I don't know how. Oh, everyone public. I did it. Well, we appreciate you stopping by, Marcy, thank you. I did open the chat up, so please feel free if you wanna drop it in the chat, you can, um, and I will read the chat out loud in case people don't see it when we're just recording. So any thoughts or feelings of what's going on in this last 10 minutes that we have? Hey, you're just a good number in it's interesting that Karen isn't here. Karen, what are you getting? Because one of the things, Karen is uh, here. Dr. Darby, wonderful discussion, um, longtime fan, first time follower of your presentations and your podcast. I will come back again. I will subscribe and click the bell um, to get subscribed. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is the conversation about um, the perception management, which is really interesting. So that's why I was going to like, Check in with Karen because one of the things that happened um, at American University after um, the protests related to 
um, the nooses and the banana peels was this, I got sold a different bill of goods, right? So it's like um, that millennial piece before activation for, you know, activist work. It was this, I'm just trying to be a good black person find a safe black place. And it's like, this ain't a safe black place. So it's, where's the perception management of conversation that's happening with that? Because it's, 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 a, it's a tricky balance, I'm, I'm certain. And that's probably yeah. this two minutes here, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, no, that's that's true, right? That's the idea of having a safe enough space, right? We can't guarantee 100% safety. It's impossible. But what I can guarantee is that we can have a space where we can have a discussion when things are have the rupture. That's safe enough. The problem is, is that when you're shaping the narrative, everybody wants to go for this, like, we're so inclusive, we're so this, we're so that. And that does give people a sense of hope. And when that bubble pops, they're like, wait, but I thought I thought you were the, the space, you promised. And so it's not just the action that actually happened, but it's the disappointment that follows us, that's, that's really fueling what's going on. And I think even too, going back to the use of social media and black, what Black news are doing to its liberation is that we're saying, we're taking the disappointment and we're not just holding on to it for ourselves. We're gonna make sure you're held accountable because this disappointment is not on us. Like we, we, we're disappointed that we trusted you and this happened, but also you shouldn't have done this in the first place. <laughs> and so that's the, that's the thing that's different than before. Cause I think in the past generations, they didn't have the ability because of social reasons to actually hold people accountable. We do. So I think that's a little bit different. Good, good point. Any other thoughts? Calvin, what was your question for me? <laughs> what, what was your question for me, Mr. Haney? Oh, I, did I have a question for you? mentioned you Karen. Said, yeah, you said, um, I, I noticed Karen was- Oh, the other Karen. No, not Karen. No. Oh, not me. I can not... craft a question for you, Miss Karen Edwards, but no, I, no. Karen Casella, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, wow, he's playing Karen on the spot. <laughs> right. I know, I forgot there was two Karens on the call, I'm sorry. This was great. Thank you. It was great. Um, I'm definitely gonna be attending the others as well. Um, I think this is an awesome initiative that AUCC has put together, but this was awesome. Thank you. you know, we're trying to have this dialogue and these conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a nice um, it's a nice compliment to, you know, what CDI does. But um, I appreciate getting the, I guess the cycle the the cycle the psychosocial kind of um, element to these uh, dilemmas, right? So, mm -hmm. I think one of the potentials that hopefully we can exploit it as we get more comfortable in these spaces is giving the staff the opportunity to have a chance to really or workshop their perspectives the same. So it's not just listening to the information, but it's like, okay, what's, you know, cause I'm taking a risk with some of the things I'm sharing, but I'm getting some feedback about how they feel about students. So more, more staff participating in the discussion and putting their thoughts into the chat generates some quality feedback loops that, that I benefit from as well. But I'm still learning and growing too. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I, I think um, that's the beauty of having these discussions. And that's why I wanted to have make sure I have the space to have discussions that we're learning together, right? We're building community together. Um, and that's where we're needed. And that's how liberation is fought is again, decolonization of the mind, educating all of us from different perspectives and seeing the humanity in each other. We're not just faculty and staff. Um, and for those who are watching this, you're not just students, um, but you're also human. So how can we be human together? I'm glad I came to the to the discussion because I um I wasn't sure if this was geared towards a student population or if it was I it was unclear to me. Um so sometimes I kind of hesitate to attend some some of some of these events because I know that some of them are like student focused 
but I'm, I'm glad that I, I, I said, I'm going to come. Cause I, I think that there's, I can always learn, right. I can, I'm learning along with the students and even if it is student centered, um, I think it's helpful for, for, for us who are um, in student affairs to have an idea of what is being presented to the students and then how, how we then engage in, in the content with them as well, right? So I have gone to some student-centered events as well. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I, I came. We're glad you came too. <laughs> There's a piece about people's story stuff from Fieri's work that you can drill down in because it's a, I mean, it's like weird that with Fieri being the foundation, like it's people's history and that collecting people's stories and the organizing of that. So there's a, there's a great conversations that if, if, if the students hear about how you begin to collect that, that voice and sort of share that and establish from that because I, it was interesting I think we're gonna go how you, it, it's like you set up the, the ends of the poles in terms of non-active, new into a situation where they're discovering their, their blackness before wokeness and then fully woke out there with the Molotov cocktail. But there's this journey and dynamic, I'm, hey, recorded folks, we're not really advocating Molotov yeah, cocktail. It's just an extreme example of activist activity. Is that what I mean? But what I'm saying is the conversation about before the real extreme activity, going out protesting for what you experience is, is being um, uh, oppression and racism and systemic, you know, issues. That there is a place in the middle where it's the collection and collaboration of voices that is of value for student organizations, but also valuable in your research. That what, over, as they yeah. begin to invest some time in the research for Freire's work, they can find some intersection in that. But that's all the, oh the long-winded was there. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I only got an hour, Calvin. I only had an hour, <laughs> right? But what you're also talking about is um, narrative therapy, the, the power of telling your story and the healing that can come from telling your story. And that's so important. That's why I think social media is, is a huge part in those liberations because you're giving people who did not have the voice, not have the voice, they didn't have the power and the authority to tell their story, the power to do that. And, and no one can take it away because we've seen it. We pick a video down, that same video will pop up in three different sites so fast. It's like, well, what's the whole point? Um, so I, I appreciate all that. So I'm gonna share the last little bit in our three minutes together. Once I figure out how to do this. Okay. So in the final thoughts, I um, just wanna remind people that the fight for black liberation has been ongoing and is constantly changing. So I may have this presentation up now in a year or so, two years, three years, five years, I could be doing a whole different type of presentation. I especially think that the Gen Zers are really going to take social media to a whole new platform when it comes to how you use it in the fight of liberation. Um, liberation is not, liberation's goal is not to become the new oppressor, but to move toward the humanization of all. I cannot stress this enough. You don't defeat the bully to become the new bully. That, that's not it. That's not power. What that is, is just, just becoming a new oppressor. Black millennials are attempting to achieve liberation with the use of social media, being intentionally inclusive and using person power to push the movement forward. And last but certainly not least, remember the word vase as a way to provide support for Black millennials who are engaging in liberation behaviors, validate, acknowledge, provide support and educate. And that is all I have, so I thank you guys for joining me today. I want to thank AUCC for hosting a Monday Night Chat.